I want to thank everyone for coming to uh, a panel that, as um, Beavis and Butthead would have said, uh, words. It'll be a lot of uh, talking about uh, metaphors and theories, and uh, but the panelists I know will have a lot to um, to present about. Um, I organized this panel as a way of um, bridging a gap between the department that I work for at the Met Museum, which is uh, the print publications department, and um, not just the increasing amount of digital content that's coming out of museums, but uh, the increasing uh, interest that museum directors have in uh, visitor experience, uh, which is becoming a larger and larger part of what all of us are doing, whether it's print or uh, digital or any kind of content. Um, print, I think, has had a history of seeing audience as something that other people in the museum take care of. You make the book and it goes out there and if people buy it, that's the audience, and if people write to you about it, that's audience engagement. Um, but I don't think that's going to cut it uh, in the way that museums are evolving now. Um, so as we move on into metaphors, uh, what exactly is a grand unified theory? Um, fortunately, I wrote the proposal and sent it in. It was accepted before I'd actually read carefully what a grand unified theory was. Um, this may or may not be uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson, depending on um, who you believe. Um, basically, we smash things together and we discover the world through the trails that get left behind. Um, in the world of physics, it's the unification of um, electromagnetism, the strong and the weak nuclear forces. And I know everyone says, oh, okay, I, I knew that. Um, but what does this have to do with museums? And um, for that, you turn to metaphor. Um, here's a lot of text from two different thinkers on, um, on the Grand Unified Theory. Uh, Murray Gell-Mann, who's responsible for a lot of the models that we follow nowadays with particles. And um, John Sisk, who's writing sort of for more of a C.S. Um, C.S. Lewis, C.P. Snow kind of take on science and faith, um, but to them, uh, metaphor is still very important. Um, and when you try to tell stories about telling stories um, in the museum setting, you speak to art historians, uh, business people, lawyers, uh, whether it's uh, council's office or rights issues, uh, print publishers, the digital people merchandise, and increasingly multiple audiences. Um, that's a lot of stories and not a lot of time to tell those stories. Um, now, when looking at uh, my own career at the Met, when I first started there a certain number of years ago, um, the metaphor that I was told was to think of the Met as uh, pre-revolutionary France. Um, with my department as sort of a well-connected but kind of remote uh, duchy, which I guess isn't a bad way to think about it when you're a couple years out of college. Um, but I think over time, I've actually started to think of us as a space arc on a thousand-year journey to populate some distant planet with, over time, clans and tribes kind of move through the building and settle various parts of the ship, develop their own languages, develop their own belief systems. Um, and it's a metaphor that no one, at least in any kind of professional capacity, has told me uh, doesn't work to describe a place as large as the Met. Um, your institution might be smaller, but um, the way that we're developing metaphors within our institutions um, can feel sort of very remote. And as we know, neither of those metaphors um, mean that things will always go smoothly. Um, I'm glad that we no longer think of ourselves as pre-revolutionary France, considering what happened to them. Um, and uh, I couldn't find an image of that space arc falling out of the sky, so uh, this, will, this will have to do. Um, and when you work in print publishing, you've probably been feeling you're on the right side for 20 years or so. Um, additional metaphors that I looked at um, were from uh, Douglas Hofstadter's book, um, Godel Escher Bach, An Eternal Golden Braid, um, which is one of those books you need to read about 17 times before you realize you don't understand it. Um, and lots and lots of stories by um, Jorge Luis Borges, who I uh, misidentified at the bottom, so ignore that. Um, and 
Hofstadter uh, looked at uh, Kurt Godel, M.C. Escher, and um, Johann Sebastian Bach as people who developed or looked at content systems that would start to speak about themselves. Um, a lot of Borges' stories fold in upon themselves. Um, this story is basically just a paragraph long um, about a map that essentially becomes what it's trying to describe. Um, he has a lot of stories like that. Um, Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote, Library of Babel, and one of my favorites, uh, Talan Ukbar, uh, Orbis Tertius, where the story about something fictional becomes a real thing on its own. Um, the importance isn't, isn't that we make tech to manage our tech, um, but that we're increasingly telling stories about the way that we tell stories in the institution. And um, I want, I'm hoping that people start to look at our own internal storytelling techniques and um, how we learn about how we learn and the content that we use to make our content. Um, to connect this to the Grand Unified Theory, the content forces in a museum, you could probably do them in any order, uh, digital, print, or, or as it's known, legacy, gallery experience, and then there's lots of internal systems. Um, but whichever ones we want to look at, um, we do need to figure out how to unify them, um, as we've tried to do with the Grand Unified Theory. Um, now, one thing I discovered as I studied the Grand Unified Theory is, is that there's actually a separate thing called the theory of everything. Um, and the theory of everything is when you bring gravity into it. Um, and so, in my opinion, gravity is visitor experience. These are a few um, interesting uh, definitions of visitor experience I found. Um, Actually, and earlier um, this week, there was a talk um, from the Met's new head of merchandising, Joe Prosser, who came to us from the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, had a bookstore background. Um, and to her, retail and exhibitions are merging in the sense that um, retail makes your life part of the object. Museums now try to make objects um, a meaningful part of your life. Um, and visitor experience is merging together a lot of museum activities in so many different ways, um, internal and external, physical and virtual, what it means to be an audience member, what happens to people when they enter your doors or go to your website or download your app. Um, it doesn't make museums feel special um, to say that what we do is no different than an amusement park where visitor experience has always been part of it, or a restaurant, or a movie theater, or watching a TED talk, or participating in a tweet chat. Um, but if all life is becoming an experience, as we've been hearing so much, um, museums need to respond um, to make what we do that special part of the um, experience, and vice versa. Um, in looking at a metaphor that might link all of the things that museums are doing into visitor experience, um, one thing that always struck me was how um, print publishers ignore the fact that um, user experience has been part of print since um, writing was developed. Um, this is a cuneiform tablet at the Met, so that's 4,000 years old. It's a different kind of user experience. Um, this is a gospel book when um, uh, religious works were moving from scrolls into, into the codex. Um, these are user experience, and um, let's see if this works. If anyone, um, this made quite the rounds in the um, in the print world, and at a few print-oriented conferences, everyone thought this was quite amusing. This is um, a medieval help desk as um, IT shows a monk how a book works. Um, we don't have to watch all of it. Um, but I saw a lot of people in publishing uh, watching this, laughing at it, and then just going back and thinking it had nothing to do with, with print. Um, but the point that it made, and it's a point that I think people in print are starting to understand, is that there is such a thing as user experience. Um, and here's a, the monk finding out that um, something moves from one page 
to the next. All available for download. Um, so if print UX is book design and gallery UX is experience design, um, all museum UX really is visitor experience. And the, uh, the three speakers I asked to join me um, are going to talk about experience in a few different ways. Um, I'm going to introduce them all so that um, we don't have to run around too much. Uh, Corey Pressman is a strategist at uh, Metal Toad Productions in Portland. Um, I've always thought that um, Corey and I have had a lot of conversations about um, the past and the history of content. Um, he has an anthropological background. Um, he's a founder in digital thinking and design company Exprima Media. Um, currently experienced strategist at, oh, oops. At the Met? It's just your announcement that I saw that go up. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> <for> that. <laughs> at, the, at the end of it, everyone will get hired. He's got a pay cut. <laughs> exactly. Well, it, eh. Space Arc. <laughs> I want to be the cook on the Space Arc. Is it me the Metal Toads? <laughs> yes. Is it the Metal Toads? Metal Toads Space Arc. Yep. Exactly. Um, uh, Corey is also a fellow at Arizona State University Center for Science and the Imagination. Um, they've done some very interesting work with um, different kinds of user experience and actually coined a phrase that I thought was very interesting, which was um, uh, that print has a UX and is a mature culture, and that's why um, not all print books have translated well into, into e-books. Um, He's author of Ancient Marginalia, a blog series about the future of reading, one history lesson at a time. Author of Postbook Paratext, Designing for Haptic Harmony. And um, what I remember is he visited the Met, and um, the thing he wanted to go straight to was um, an exhibit of um, early codices, like the one that I showed um, from our Hildesheim uh, exhibition. Uh, Jennifer Foley, um, she and I have had a lot of conversations about um, sort of the present of um, content and story um, and terms you use inside the museum to talk about the terms that you use and the stories that you tell. Uh, she's an art historian by training, did her PhD in Southeast Asian art history, um, can tell you all about Cambodian, Cham, and Vietnamese art if you really, really want to know. Um, though if you walk through uh, the Dallas Art Museum with her, you'll find out a lot of very interesting um, things about the objects there as well as uh, her own experience. Um, she's an accomplished educator and expert in interpretation, first at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond, now at the Cleveland uh, Museum of Art, or CMA, um, where she leads the Department of Interpretation. Uh, she's been involved in Art Lens, uh, the museum's collection-wide app, and specialist exhibition, audio tours, and interactives, as well as public programming, and lots and lots and lots of labels. And she just wanted me to tell everyone that Cleveland rocks. <laughs> is it true? It is true that Cleveland rocks. Let's see. All right, we're going to try this one more time. There we go. And um, Kimon Karamidis is assistant professor and director of Digital Media Lab at the Bard Graduate Center. Um, one of his primary roles is to oversee digital initiatives in the Focus Gallery Project. Uh, that's a curricular laboratory that produces um, exhibitions based on faculty research. He and I have had a lot of uh, very interesting conversations about um, where uh, faculty work and student work inside of an educational setting where they're actually making digital things as they're working and as they're doing their research, rather than waiting until the end of everything and then uh, putting up a website then or building a wiki right then. Um, he'll be discussing the way that user experience frames and pervades uh, the Focus Gallery project, um, from the design of student experience in the classroom to student involvement in the uh, development and prototypes and interpretive materials to the finalization and development of material for public display. Um, so now that I've used up sort of my lifetime allocation of metaphors, uh, I'll turn it over to Corey to start. 
And um, we'll come back at the end with some questions and the definition of the theory of everything. So thank you. Oh, we do. <laughs> Sneezes are you about. Hello. How's it going? You in the post karaoke haze? Space Cadet Glow. Okay. Yeah. How's that look? I'm not getting my notes though. I need my notes. It's cute, right? I want my notes. It's a mirror your display on system preferences. Watch your language. Okay, hold on a second. I'm gonna mirror my display publicly. Right here? No, no, no. No, 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 no. It's a display. No. Yeah, you go. Let me go to arrangement. Go down. Oh, you have to unmirror this. <laughs> Make up your mind, Admiral. Okay. Let's see. Yes. Hi. Hi. So thank you, Robert, for inviting me to do this. I'm not um, a museum person per se. I'm a strategist and consultant. And I've worked with museums. I'm working with the Portland Art Museum now to um, rejuvenate their collection site. And there's so much interesting things going on in collection sites. And we help Portland Art Museum with the interaction design of their site. But I am a, a media person. And ultimately, I think museums are an extremely important form of media. And media, as we know right now, are going through a lot of changes. And so what I want to talk about is maybe how media changes happened in other contexts and how everyone lived in those contexts and were fine, and how maybe museums can be more than fine through here in that they will not fall away. Um, and one of the things that they provide us is reciprocal creation, which is actually a phrase I borrowed from Patty Ann Rogers, this poet who has this amazing book about reciprocal creation, and that's what poetry does. And I think that's what, that's what museums are really all about. Um, but first, let's start at the beginning. What is this? It's not a rock. It's so much more. It's so much, it's a tool. That's exactly it. It's like, but it's, it was like a rock three seconds ago and now it's a tool. But this is a subtle and amazing thing. This is a tool called an Acheulean hand axe that was carried around by Homo erectus some 3.5 million years ago. Um, no, sooner than that. Did you notice this light fixture, by the way? Yeah. That thing is epic, man. Yeah. So we went from the Acheulean hand axe to that. Yeah. You know, that's that's, that's not <laughs> subtle. That's not a subtle difference. But essentially, <laughs> this is gonna distract the crap out of me now. <laughs> if it starts to attack, <laughs> run. So um, the, Ache the Acheulean hand axe is the same as that because, well, see, this was made by Homo erectus, so it's the same genus as us, but a different species. But what's amazing is, like, the gods of Olympus took pause when this was made, because Homo erectus, wherever they went, carried these things around with them. They had this global, mobile technology that completely changed how they were as creatures, as a species. Because of this, you find Homo erecti, Homo erectuses, um, but it started in Africa, Homo erectus, but then you found them, like, in China, you found them all, or you found them everywhere you could basically survive um, or, or get to um, at the time. There was no land bridge, so you didn't find them in the New World, but they were everywhere, and they had fire, they had clothes, they had baby sign language, and they had this thing. But it's technology that defines our genus, and it's it's handheld technology. So there's this kind of this idea that technology is what buoys us is an old idea. It's not it's not something to be scared of. And I guess one of the things I like to to remind myself is when people talk about technology, the first thing, and this is what I want you to do from now on, promise me, that when you hear the word technology, picture this. Right? Because that's what we're talking about, really. And picture Homo erectus out there, ugh, Chinese planes. I'm not sure if they were planes, but they, yes, Chinese planes with glaciers, and there they are, surviving out there. But then something amazing happens. Um, many years forward, and you get this. This is a Homo sapiens artifact, and this is the difference between that and the Acheulean hand axe. That and that are exactly the same thing. This is what archaeologists like to call non-utilitarian artifact. You like that? Right? But obviously it has the ultimate utility, which is sharing our thoughts, brains, and passions with other people in a medium that's more permanent than you are. That's the human trick, to offload your story and leave it there so that when you die, the ghost remains to tell. But can we trust it to tell? Depends on how, you know, how good your medium is. And in this case, it was a cave wall, which is fantastic, because it's still there. It's hundreds of thousands of years later, and we're grooving on it. But basically, this is all we've done since then. Um, there hasn't been much improvement. 
since cave art. That's really what we're still doing. Um, and we're still doing it on a very essential level in that there's a message and there's a medium for it. And that medium is part of the message itself. Have you heard that kind of phrase before? Right? It's a bit of a cliche, but I apologize. I'm in the private sector. It's how we get by. So <laughs> just kidding. you all have metaphors. I have cliches. Buy low, sell high, I always say. Uh, that's a very off-color thing I almost said. Uh, that's good. But really what we're dealing with when you have cave art is that there's this stuff that surrounds it that affects its message. It was buried deep in caves. You had to get a torch. You had to get your gumption up. You had to go down deep into a scary place and witness this by flickering firelight. And it, that was the form of its narrative. And in the book world, we call that its paratext. It's the stuff that surrounds the text that affects its interpretation. It's more than a boundary or sealed border. The paratext, rather, is a threshold. And this is the ultimate book on paratext. But it's that threshold where meaning is created. It wasn't just cave arts that were dropped from planes on postcards or something. That would be a different meaning. It's the, the meaning is accessed through that threshold. Bear with me. It's a zone between text and off text. Can you tell this was written in French originally? <laughs> a zone, a zone not only of transition, like a cigarette, but also of transaction. A privileged place of pragmatics and of strategy. Hey of an influence on the public, an influence that is, and at the service of a better reception for the text and a more pertinent reading of it. You start, maybe you're just starting to think, because you're museum people, you're probably thinking, ah, right? You're thinking, ah, someone think, ah. Uh, you have, uh, you have the objects, but then you have the paratext that you create around those objects, and that's what you're in the business of, eh? You're not warehousers, you're experience housers. You're paratext authors. You're, uh, the paratext is a fringe of the printed text which in reality controls one's whole reading of the text. It's the fringe, it's the threshold, that's where it happens. And you are the threshold. The objects could sit in the basement and you'd still be like museum-y in that you have all the stuff, but what makes it a museum is the threshold that you generate. So you're threshold authors. Isn't that exciting? That's a pretty cool job to be, to have. I'm a threshold author. So from now on, when someone asks what you do, what are you going to say? I am a threshold, threshold author, right? And do you have a light? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a paratext artist. <laughs> Do you have a light? Mike from Portland Art Museum wrote, if the lights go out in the museum and all the Wi-Fi hotspots and screens go dark, we might lose the physical technology infrastructure, but we do not lose the most powerful, participatory, networked, open source culture that has taken root in our audiences and communities in the 21st century. In this regard, digital technology cannot simply fall away. So that paratech, you digging that? Yeah. Not cool? I said it's not cool. Yeah. Right? It's from Portland, so of course it's cool. <laughs> um, but basically, that paratext that we're creating is in a cultural context. Not, you know, obviously, some of the cave art had the cave man cultural context, and <clears throat> torches made sense at the time, but now we have a different context, and it's that context that we're creating in. That's what's so groovy about what we have going on. The lights can go out, but digital is still there. Digital and computers, and Kimono and I were grooving on this last night. I think it was a two-drink dinner discussion. Um, two drinks would come on and you're there, man, you're full theory. And we were talking about how your computers are one and zero counting things and that's great, but they've done something else. They've transformed society because that's what media and that's what media does. That's what the Julian Hand Axe did and that's what cave art did. It transformed society. So it's not just the ones and zeros anymore. It's the, what's resulted and that's this digital culture that we live in. It's a digital mindset that they write, he writes in this paper. And it's so now that's, you can see it here at this, at this conference. People are talking about, is it an audience or are they users, this digital word is leaking in, right? It's called them users now because that's a digital word. The mindset is help. ultimately they're what, by the way? People. There's people, right? There are people who want stuff from you. Um, in this case, they want identity building. Mr. Falk. Um, it's about empowerment, discoverability, openness, um, peer voice. It's, uh, they're looking for promiscuous institutions, um, gregarious institutions. This is the stuff that, this is the culture that museums are in. And you have this moral role in this in this new environment, to create civic dialogue, to provide muse, to provide inspiration. Again, you're not the warehouse. And now the people that you're not warehousing to, that audience, those people, have expectations because of digital. So we're here to come up with a theory of, of what is it? User experience? A unified theory. Thank unified you. Theory, unified user theory. Experience, user experience. It, if it had gravity in it, it would be? 
theory of everything. Theory of everything, theory of everything. right. So whew, luckily, no gravity. Um, <laughs> and no quiz. A theory, essentially, is an assertion of what we don't know. It's a maybe of some kind, right, in science, basically a maybe. A maybe that's hopefully shrinking, but it's a maybe nonetheless. And I'd like to say that we're in what I call the maybe scene era, where if you do an engram of how often maybe's showing up in books, it's been showing up a lot right around 1969, right? It's been very maybe full since then. It's something to do with Jimi Hendrix dying. And we're like, oh, <laughs> now what? I guess maybe... I don't know what reality means anymore. But we're in this kind of maybe rich environment, which is fantastic. These are the great forking paths of the wonder world that we're in now. We don't know where we're going. It's wide open possibilities. And so where we've been and where we're going is, um, <clears throat> is important. Let me put it in terms of, again, this is from like book media studies, but you are a medium yourself. Back in the day, in the cave art day, I'm getting a lot of juice out of that slide. In the cave art day, um, it was, it's what Walter Ong called a period of, of orality. That's when there was no writing and all the storytelling and most of the art, aside from cave art, was done face to face in an oral environment. Oral and aural. Dig that? Aural. Help me out. Just say, okay, thank you. Because <laughs> sometimes I have dreams I'm presenting and I don't know if this is one of those or not. Um, <laughs> so if you make noise, I know it's not. What's that? I'm right, right, it's true in the dreams. Although I'm missing a button in my shirt. Um, so it's, uh, it's a sensual world in which you have your senses are about you when you're experiencing stories and storytelling. It's 360, you're there listening to people. It's situated, the stories you're telling are happening right there, Kimon. They don't go away, they're not being saved. It's oral culture, it's fluid, it's mnemonic. Everyone has to memorize everything. The Odyssey is basically an enormous, gorgeous memory game. Um, it's relational, it's interactive. Authorship, ethnographic studies indicate that authorship, the way we think of it, doesn't exist in orally based cultures, some of which exist to this day, and certainly in the 60s, mid-century, existed more so, mid-last century. But they don't have authorship in the same way. It's the story is a third-party thing that lives, and you remember it in some way or another and touch it, but there's no authorship per se. Obviously, that changed with the printing press. I mean, it did, took a little too long, I think, but I can't change that. But you wind up with print culture, which is visually based. You with me? You, thank you. Woo. It's solipsistic. You do it alone, standing in a corner, right? There you are alone. Sometimes your lips, when, if, when books first came out, everyone read with their lips moving. It was just a practice. They don't, because it was like speech. It was speaky, but because that was an oral culture that they were basing their behavior on. But then you close your mouth and you're staring at this thing blankly. I could imagine like parents of teenagers in 1650 being like, what's wrong with you? Just, just staring at this paper all day. It's no good. Violent stories, you're gonna, it's terrible. I don't know how my mother got here, but here she is. Um, it's the, hey ma, it's desituated. In other words, you know, the story and the storyteller are completely far apart from each other. It's static and there's authority. There's real authorial authority. There's author, get it, authority. There's, there's an author there behind it all. And that's starting to change, um, actually. We live in a print culture, but things have gone haywire with this digital thing that Kimon and I talked about. These, they're called computers and they work on ones and zeros and somehow have changed our minds about things. But the computers actually didn't start at all. It started with radio and television. Who's this guy who looks just like my grandfather, strangely? That's Marshall McLuhan in the most interesting picture I've ever seen. Why the shell? The phones I kind of get, but why the shell? Why the shell? Benjamin and Hedges and the shell. But at the time when radio came out and television, people are bugging out. Um, Marshall McLuhan writes, our new electronic culture provides our lives again with a tribal base. And he's talking about radio. Imagine, right? Show this guy HTML, his shell would explode behind him. <laughs> um, and uh, at, at, when radio first came out, an early comment, commentor, commentator wrote, how fine is the texture of the web that radio is? Huh? Spinning... It's, um, it, it's achieving the task of making us feel together, think together, live together. Radio was blowing minds. And Marshall McLuhan's like, you know, if we keep this up, we'll start having media that actually become multi-sensual again. Like we can hear things. Maybe we can, maybe we can like get sensual again. He called it a new era of haptic harmony. When your senses are reinvolved again in storytelling. And again, this is all pre-HTML, but they're getting it. They're picking it up. And then here's the cutest priest in the history of all time. Walter Ong. Isn't he adorable? Everyone say, aw. Aw. Thanks, Walter. He says, okay, well, Dr. Ong, sorry. No, 
Father Ong, says, um, all right, check this out. So it's print culture, there was orality, but now we have these things like radio and stuff showing up. Maybe we're entering a period of secondary orality. This is the world that museums inhabit. It's actually our job. I'm lumping myself in because I just got hired by the Met, evidently. It's our job. Uh, <laughs> take the pay cut. That's fine. Just give me the New York experience. That it's our job to usher in secondary or rally. There's no other place like a museum to do this. It's museums and like video games. That's it. Who should win that one? Video Who games. should win that one? <laughs> That's like you always rock. Back. <laughs> You can stop if you wanted to. You could get help <laughs> if you wanted to. I'm Secondary orality is oral and aural and visual. It's all of those things. It's sensual again. You're in spaces with other people having experiences. It's situated and desituated. It's dynamic. It's relational and interactive. There's authorship and there's non-authorship and there's omni-authorship. There's co-creation going on at a scale that's, you know, unprecedented. It wasn't possible in oral cultures because there was small and face-to-face, -face, but now we have digital and we can have enormous global anonymous or non-anonymous co-authorship. And it should be mediated by you. You know, Random House isn't going to do it. it sh I wish it was happening in publishing because they're like good clients, but they're not going to do it. But I think museums can. A more deliberate and self-conscious orality based permanently on the use of writing and print. That's what he's talking about. And that's the space that we operate. And it's not new. People were anticipating this for a while. This is from 1900 Ladies Home Journal, What May Happen in the Next 100 Years. Um, aside from some dreary things in there, like there will be no wild animals except in menageries, um, it says, man, sorry ladies, will see around the world, persons and things of all kinds will be brought within focus of cameras connected electrically with screens at opposite ends of circuits, thousands of miles at a span, the instrument bringing these distant scenes to the very doors. I love that line. Of people will be connected with a giant telephone apparatus transmitting each incidental sound to its appropriate place. Yeah, basically, yeah. 1900, Ladies Home Journal, like this. They wouldn't be surprised if we went back and showed, what they'd be surprised is what we haven't done. You know, no offense, but it's like Adobe Digital Publishing, that's all we can do? <laughs> I'm just saying, like, the, the ancients are pissed. They're like, you have it all. And then, so what have you done, really? Oh, well, we've got ebooks. The Memex, Vannevar Bush, in mid-century, invents this thing in his head, a desk with microfiche that serves things up. He, he wants the whole canon of all human knowledge put on microfiche and put into your desk. And it gets updated by like guys from uniforms who come, like slapstick guys who come and give you new microfiche. But you'd have it all there at your fingertips. Basically, it's a hyperlinked microfiche system he invented. And he predicted that there will be many of these in the future. Every house will have them. And when they do, wholly new forms of encyclopedias will appear. I hope you're getting chills. Ready made with a mesh of associative trails running through them. There's a new profession of trailblazers. Those who find delight in the task of establishing useful trails through the enormous mass of the common record. Y'all are those trailblazers. <laughs> or you can be. Or you can use, you know, digital publishing suite and just get over it. <laughs> but that we're using digital publishing suite and just getting it over with is indicative of early stages of media change. When scrolls became books, the first books looked like Scroll. scrolls. They just did. They were called incunabula. Lasted hundreds of years before someone <clears throat> of people invented you know, specific interaction design user experience protocols for the new platform. And so now we have ebooks, and what do we put in them? Page, page curl, the devil's own page curl, I like to call it. <laughs> this is the opposite of progress. We don't need these, the, what'd you call it in your paper? The siren song of the skeuomorphic? Something like that. Rob, right? I said that actually. <laughs> so, write that down. At C.S. Pressman, it's siren it's song. Great. Of the skeuomorphic. But that's what's out there, and it's fine, it's fine. Let Apple make page curl, put that in there. We're not Apple, we're museums, right? We're the warehousers of experiences, of connecting us to the rest of the human experience. So let's get past the incanabula. The promise of digital is this, to provide means of sharing information and storytelling, which leverage the benefits of both orality and print in fluid, physical, and experiential modes. This is your job. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I'm starting to feel like it preachy. <laughs> this, is, this is your job. But it, it kind of is, right? If you were anywhere you work in a museum, this is really what you're doing. This is bringing secondary or rally to light. And you've been doing it ever since television screens. Um, wow. I told myself, so we went to a honky tonk bar. 
If you had told me when I went to this conference, right, thank you, that I'll go to this honky-tonk bar and I would dance around the circle track with Jennifer Foley, I wouldn't have believed you. But I did. But in the bar, I mean, there was amazing things going on in that bar, some unrepeatable in public. But the most amazing thing I found was this bathroom. This is the bathroom in the honky-tonk bar. What do you see? Scope? Big sexy hair, which I opened it, there was no hair in there. <laughs> it was very, so I was like, finally, I got, I got nothing happened. Just kick me out. Um, there's Advil, there's cigarettes, anything you need. But that's what's amazing about this space. This is like a metaphor for the music. I, I challenge myself to put this in. But I, I put a John Fall quote here that the museum visitor experience, the museum visitor experience is ephemeral and constructed and renewed each time you visit the experience, right? Users don't have this monolithic, this is why I go to a museum. It's say, this is why I'm going to the museum today. Just like this bathroom. I might go into that bathroom for the big sexy hair. I might go in the bathroom just to go wee wee. I might go in the bathroom to buy some cigarettes, but it's kind of like a um, this plastic environment that we're creating. It's the paratext of the experience. And if it's got many possibilities, we're doing our job right. People's experience of this bathroom and of your museum are based on granular, in the moment, identity related needs. Yeah? So we've got to be as flexible as this bathroom. Are you going to let this bathroom beat you? <laughs> no, right? Do something to those 18th century rooms in the Met to make me enjoy them. Put, put some big sexy hair in there. <laughs> Something. Who, said, who says we don't have it? <laughs> I've, I've looked. <laughs> I search high and low for big sexy hair. Um, but here, right here, you're doing it. This was, I took these pictures also just while I was here. And this is what's going on at, um, at the museum just up the street. And what is this? Did you see this there? There's a whole bouquet exhibit, which is amazing, by the way. I did not expect to get teary-eyed looking at paintings of flowers, but I did. That Van Gogh gets you every time. You least expect it. Just, you know, wandering around, slightly hung over, and then bang out. <laughs> there he is. Like, I might have one ear, but you have one heart. So, in this exhibit, that's what he's saying. In this exhibit, um, there's this little space in there inviting people to go ahead. There's a bouquet of flowers in the middle of the room, and there's these buckets, and th I, I got teary-eyed that maybe it was just the hangover, but I got teary-eyed again. Look how open this is. This is like that bathroom. It's saying, come in and participate, co-author this experience. It's a gallery full of authority, but you also have authority as a human being, as a creative person. You have the authority to sit down and make something yourself, and there's this beautiful, I have some emotional connection to things going on here because it's art for crying out loud, right? And it's an art museum, so it's warehousing the experience of art, whether it was freshly made or been curated. Um, in this case, it wasn't curated. There's the Center for Creative Connections. Walter Ong would weep at the sight of this. This is, uh, maybe, this is secondary orality happening at the institutional level. So bravo to Dallas for not dropping the ball and beating video games to ushering in secondary orality. That's awesome. Thank you to Dallas. I'm not done. I will be soon, though, I promise. <laughs> Thank you very much. Goodbye. Um, and we're not alone in this. I know it's terrifying to have someone from, like, you know, system consultant from the private sector tell you, this is what you all got to do, and I'm sure you're pissed. Like, well, I don't even know how. But you don't have to know how, because you can create partnerships with people in the world who are doing this. Unlike when books went from scrolls to books, there were no interaction designers at the time. There was no UX profession. But now there is. There are UX professionals working for the interaction, work, or members of the Interaction Design Association. Um, interact, have you heard of this organization? Very nice people, very clean, like y'all. Interaction design defines the structure and behavior of interactive systems. Yes, yeah, so you're not alone. It's not like the director comes and says, make it, we have to introduce secondary orality. And you don't have to panic now. You can be like, okay, no big deal. I'll go find an interaction designer like those at Middle Toad Media based in Portland, Oregon, 97236. <laughs> uh, sad to get that out. Um, but interaction designers strive to create meaningful relationships between people and the products and services they use. Thousands of people that are members of this. They have their own conference, which is amazing. So there's, there's a whole profession for this that you can leverage so that when we create our beautiful museum spaces, they're not just that. Museums so much are about the objects and about the architecture and about the experience and maybe in that order. But if we can get interaction designers into the discussion, we can kind of fold that in. This is a beautiful museum, by the way, in Korea. Isn't that nice? Prehistory museum. I said, isn't that nice? Okay. Beautiful. beautiful. Huh? Do they have axes? Do they have a hand axe? I think so. I think that's what's down there. But I'm not sure. 
But we got to find out. If everyone sends a dollar to the middle of the room, I can start getting money to go there. So one of my favorite quotes from art history is, hardening of the categories causes art disease. And it's, it's, been, it's been attributed to two people, W. Eugene Smith, who is photographed there. Um, he's a photojournalist. And then also Harry Holtzman, who was a neoplasticist um, and a friend of Mondrian. So I put Mondrian and the guy together. But it doesn't matter who's, but that's my prerogative as a modern cave painter, right? Right? Hey, art happening right here. Um, but hardening of the categories causes art disease, and that's something I don't want us to do. I don't want us to say, I know this is hard, and it's institutional for y'all, but just keep this philosophically in your mind, that you know, exhibit design and, and other portions of the museum are all intermingled, and think of them as more fluid than not. Get whiteboarding. So this is my last slide. Ultimately, the metaphor that we can use is that of lichen. I love lichen. You love lichen? Yeah. Gotta love lichen, man. Let's hear for lichen. It's an amazing life form. You like and lichen? I like and lichen. Thank you. That was at CS Pressman. I'm lichen lichen. I said that first. Um, that yeah, because it's a mutualistic creature. It's not. It's fungus and algae and sometimes bacteria and little creatures called water bears. Look them up. The craziest looking things in the world. All aren't they cool? All living together to create this new thing. It's basically mutualism in nature. And of course, mutualism is an anarchist economic theory. I'm saying that we should all be creators and all be driving production. Thank you, internet. Um, and it's also, you know, when two organisms will live on each other, this co-creation and create a third thing that's different. And that's what every person standing in front of your exhibit is, is a lichen with the substrate that you've given them, the algae that they're bringing, and this whole new experience that's created at that time, just like when I walked into that honky-tonk bathroom. And I want to finish with a poem by Lou Welch, beat poet, who wrote about um, lichen in a poem called Springtime in the Rockies. All these years, I have overlooked them in the racket of the rest, this symbiotic splash of plant and fungus feeding on rock, on sun, a little moisture, air, tiny acid factories dissolving salt from living rocks and eating them. Here they are blooming, trail rock, talus and scree, all dusted with it, rust ivory, brilliant yellow green, and cliffs like murals, huge panels streaked and patched, quietly with shooting stars and lupine at the base. Closer, with the glass, a city of cups, clumps of mushrooms, and where do the plants begin? Why are they doing this? In this big sky and all around me, peaks and melting glaciers, why am I made to kneel and peer at tiny? These are the stamps of the final envelope. How can the poisons reach them? In such thin air, how can they care for the loss of a million breaths? What possibly could make their ground more bare? Let it all die. The hushed globe will wait and wait for what is now so small and slow to open it again. As now, indeed, it opens it again. This scentless velvet crumbler of the rocks. This lichen. So be slow, be steady, be small, be brave, be lichen. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm, that is a tough act to follow. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <clears throat> I think when, when we initially had, had these kind of discussions uh, about uh, the panel, uh, Rob had been talking about the idea of kind of thinking about the past, the present, and the future. And so I thought the present because I'm presently working on this in a museum. Uh, and it really, uh, I think it, for my part, it came out of discussions that Rob and I have been having about um, the idea of why we call content content. Uh, and I, I'm going to front load this by saying that I really dislike the word content. And so it's sort of like, you know, why, why is this word coming from and why are we using it all the time? Uh, and what does it mean to visitors? Because we use it all the time for like all kinds of things, including with visitors. 
Uh, and so I started out just thinking like, there, museums are just chock full of all kinds of internal nomenclature. We have all sorts of things that we call things and we don't really think about what they mean outside the context of all of the people that you work with who are inside the building. Uh, and so one of the things that I think about is labels, which is something that I do uh, deal with. And so what sorts of words would you have for this? Anybody? Huh? Hey, nobody's tombstone. tombstone. Thank you. Tombstone. So tombstone, dog tag, sometimes. With it. And then we have this chat, chat. chat. and then with this. Oh. Maybe different words for this, but we we go with text panel, right? So like within the museum, we have like this one is this. This one has this name tombstone. This one has a name chat label, and this one has a name text panel. And we, even though they all are printed and they're all up on the wall, we think of them as being actually separate creatures in many ways. So when you go and talk to visitors, at least when you talk to visitors at the museum where I am, um, and you ask them, what are those things on the wall, the number one answer they give is plaque. And then that is followed up by placard, which is followed up by card. So you go from plaque to placard to card. So you really don't move very far away, but you will notice that none of them are called labels. Uh, and so what happens is um, when you ask a visitor, what are these things, they say it's a plaque, it's a plaque, it's a plaque. Uh, and they give it all the same name because for them there's no distinction between these things. They have no, you know, what is the difference between words, 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 or those words, words, words? They're all just words and they're on some sort of thing and it's stuck on the wall, so it's black. Um, and we do this all the time with all sorts of things. We do it with, for example, programs. So inside the museum we have different words for programs based on usually who does it in the museum which is sometimes defined by who they're doing it for in terms of the audience segmentation. So, uh, for example, we would call these, these are public programs, or uh, sometimes adult programs, right? Um, and this is, this is studio classes, and then we have performing arts programs, and then we have family programs, and we have community arts events, and we have other events, and then this is a rental. That's not a program. <laughs> wow. It's a private rental because somebody paid for the space. And so in the mind of the people who are working inside the museum, this is the same as this. But really, when you look at this, it doesn't really look a whole lot like that. So the, the wedding is probably the, the only one that a visitor would see is in a different category because they don't think that we put on weddings for show. Um, but to them, all of this is stuff that happens at the museum, and that's it. There is absolutely no distinction whatsoever. So we have all this weird internal usage stuff that we do that really is not visitor-centered. It's not visitor-friendly. It is not asking the visitor to take part in what we do. It is, uh, it is or to be co-creators or really on any sort of even playing field with us. It's that we have an us and a them when we use these sort of uh, words that really are an only internal and um, not external and not thinking about what that experience is for the visitor who is experiencing it externally in that way. Um, so I think about this a lot and I also think about how there's um, so much kind of internal uh, nomenclature that sometimes it is so internal that it means nothing even inside the institution. <laughs> So, I, and I, I, I feel this with deep pain because one of the words that I would put into the category of it means nothing to most of the people inside most of our institutions is in fact my title. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm the director of interpretation, which is like being the director of what? So, because the very first thing that anybody asks me, they said, so, what do you do at the museum? And I said, I am the director of interpretation. And then they get this look, it's like, Okay, what's that? You know, and then they want you to tell them, what do you do? And um, so this is what I, the, the other problem is that interpretation means different things at different places. And it means different things at different types of places. So if you work in an historic house, interpretation might mean that you are dressed like Betsy Ross. If you work at an art museum, never, never, never are you dressed like Betsy Ross. <laughs> so like there's that sort of larger issue of going across um, kind of museum types but then there's also, even within art museums, when I talk to people who work in interpretation at other art museums, and I'm like, oh, okay, so I have public programming under my department, and sometimes people are like, you do? And sometimes people will say, I do too. And so it's really a different set of responsibilities and roles depending on which institution you are working at. Um, and so this is some of the things that are uh, under um, interpretation at the, the CMA, when I am, where I am. And so what you'll see is, <clears throat> 
many of these things are actually about what is often talked about as content or content development. And you could, you could make the, the uh, argument that actually all of it is, even the programs are really content. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that I've been working quite a bit on since I, I got to the museum a few years ago is ArtLens, which is our uh, museum-wide app. And so this is very clearly a, an instance in which I am working on content, because that is what my department does, is that we make, for the permanent collection, we make the content that goes into this app. So, um, you know, when I'm thinking about all these different types of content, I, I start thinking about this idea of this word content, like what does that mean? And then when you look it up, the first definition that you get is actually not content, it's content. So the very first thing is that it's about a state of peaceful happiness. And so I think it is, <laughs> it's a little confusing to say, so what do you do? Um, I create peaceful happiness. In fact, I do not. Um, so, because if I did, then, you know, there would be a lot of changes in, in, in my life and in the world. So, uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, what we get onto the next definition of content and, you know, it's things that are held or included in something. <laughs> I, I guess so. Um, the, like, the substance or material dealt with in a speech, literary work, etc., as distinct from its form or style. This makes it sound like I have the most boring job that has ever existed. <laughs> uh, and, and it really, and so I really dislike this word content because I feel like it, it basically goes in and, like, sucks all of the life out of everything that we do. Like, really? I make stuff that goes in something else. <laughs> and, you know, and it also deals with speech, literary work, distinct from its style. Do you actually want to listen to something that is this description? I don't think anybody in this room does. So I, I think, as I'm thinking about this idea of content, I'm trying to think, like, what is a better word for this? And while I was thinking about this, I started thinking about the fact that it's not just museums that are using this word content. I'm seeing it absolutely everywhere, right? That there is, you go onto the, the internet and everyone's talking about the explosion in content marketing. And, you know, that you have uh, the content revolution. It's like, really, is the content revolting? Maybe because we're using that word. <laughs> 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 so, then I also see all this stuff about the rise of content, the right, particularly the rise of content marketing. But there's this idea like content is rising. I mean, maybe it's part of that revolution that they're having. Um, and this idea that you know you have these sort of definitions of like what is content, where is it, and what is the purpose of it. It drives me nuts when all of it is about like yes, I will buy it. It's like I don't necessarily want you to buy it. When you're in a museum, what you want is for people to buy into it and to take part in it, right? So I think that's the other thing is that I feel like there's this kind of shift with content that is being discussed as this buying it as opposed to being part of it, even when they're talking about stuff that is in ways co-creation. Um, I think it's also a little confusing. We have the rises of smart content marketing because all of the rest of it was dumb. Um, that it, wait, you know, content marketing isn't good after all. So maybe it's not really rising. Maybe it's falling. Um, but but it's rising and rising. It's rising again. And uh, and now we have content marketing executives. So it's risen to the point of having its own job. Um, however, there is a lot of <laughs> really bad content out there. And I think part of it is because when, when there is this sort of thing of like, we're going to make content, that, that because you're making content and not making the thing that is what we actually do, which is telling stories, then content kind of sucks. So I, I think kind of stepping back and thinking, what are we actually making? So I think we've all heard content is king. This is, uh, and it actually comes, to, it's a quote from um, a, a an essay that was written by, of all people, Bill Gates, who uh, rather early on saw a lot of uh, potential for the internet as a place where content would live. Um, and I, I think it's sort of, it's interesting to think about, um, you know, this, because I think we hear that quote all the time, content is king, content is king, but what does it actually mean? Um, and I think the other thing is like, when we, even within museums, there's lots and lots and lots of things that are classified as content. And so the question is, are all of these things the same? So we have, you know, the, the entry for an object on our website, uh, the collection online. We have videos that are hanging out on the blog. 
We have videos mm -hmm. that are in our lens, that are in the app. There are um, other videos that are really kind of promotional videos that were made by marketing that are hanging out on the YouTube channel. And then there is, of course, the, the text panel, a.k.a. plaque, that is in the, the galleries. And all these things are content. Um, so does label copy equal an interview with an artist, equal a performance video, equal an exhibition catalog, equal a K-12 lesson plan, online collection, app videos, marketing videos, software, are all of these things the same? Or are they all just content? Or is there something else that we should maybe be thinking about? So I, in my, I'm having this kind of perpetual struggle about what do you, if you don't call it content, what do you call it? Because the reason why you get nomenclature that pops up is because you have lots of different people that are working on things and that you have to find a, a sort of agreed upon terminology for things so that you're sort of talking about the same thing. But of course you're not, half the time when you do that you're not actually talking about the same thing and you all have different definitions in your mind about what that means. But I think one of the things that, that I think has happened is that the word content has become the neutral word. It has become the word that is okay to use to talk about that stuff that goes in the thing, right? <laughs> but whether the thing is the website, the, the app, the wall in the gallery, whatever it is, it's the stuff that goes in the thing. And that's what the curators and the educators and the IT and you know everybody can, we're just gonna call it content, marketing. It's all content. Um, so I've been thinking about like, what are other words that might possibly serve in this function? And so, you know, I start thinking like ideas. What ideas work? A thought or suggestion as to a possible course of action, an aim or purpose. And I thought about this for a while and I really thought, I don't think idea is really covering it. Even though there are ideas in the content, I don't think ideas are the content necessarily full stop. Um, story was one that I have been really attached to this idea of talking about story because really a lot of what we're, we're doing is storytelling. So I, I really like this idea of like, if we talk about it as story, maybe we'll remember that that's actually what we're doing is storytelling. Uh, and so, you know, I look up the word story and it's an account of imaginary or real, real people and events told for entertainment. And of course, if you think about it that way, and then you think about trying to, I know in my job, it would be like going and talking with a curator about using the word story and saying, oh, but it's just an account that is either imagined or real for entertainment. <laughs> And I sort of imagined how that would go, and I didn't imagine it would go well. Uh, and so then I said, you know, like, what? We have idea, we have, oh, sorry. We have all of these synonyms for story. So I thought, what are the synonyms for story? Are there ways that, that we could get around that? Because um, I think one of the, the problems with the, the definition for story is it has that word entertainment in it. <clears throat> and um, it does bring in the word imaginary, which makes a lot of people nervous in a museum. And the other issue is that the word story, the antonym for it is nonfiction and truth. <laughs> and <laughs> so if I were going to say, so what we're going to do is we're going to call it all stories because it's not true. <laughs> that, I really wouldn't go very well. So, um, you know, I, I'm, but I'm stuck on this idea of story. And then we've been, ta I've been talking to rabbis for a long time. And then really there was this sort of amazing moment that happened uh, a few weeks ago, because I was sort of like, I kind of think maybe story is it, and a little, like I'm not 100% convinced, but I'm, I'm pretty convinced. And then there was this amazing moment where basically the universe called me out. Uh, we had a, uh, a descriptive panel to explain how to use the app that was going to go into one of our spaces, into the Gallery One space, and it was going around to all the people that were looking at it, and there was one phrase that the, was describing what is in the app, and it said videos. And somebody said, well, can, can we make this sound a little, I mean, video seems a little dry, can we say something else? So then there were suggestions that went around, and um, our head of, uh, of IT suggested the word story. And I was like, oh, story. And there it was, and we all read it, and I realized this doesn't work. <laughs> I can't actually use the word story yet. And it, so it was this really sort of, a, for me, it was this kind of like, wait a second. Like, I, I felt like, you know, the universe had said, hold up, like, keep thinking. You're not quite there yet. Um, and so it was really interesting. And I, I, I so that I'm sort of moved on to narrative um, because I feel like it may, maybe, um, it gets away from some of that sort of the entertainment thing. Um, it gets, it's there, it's just not overt. 
It's more embedded. Uh, and I think the other thing is that a narrative is not um, imagine, imagined is not the first thing that you necessarily think of with narrative. That a narrative can be true and people are okay with you know either of these things. And so it feels a little more comfortable in some ways. Um, so sort of back to that, not, I'm still not convinced about narrative and, and I would love people's suggestions or thoughts about what you think might work. Um, but you know, we come back to this issue of content being king and I think one of the, the things as we think about content development and whether or not all of these different things um, are they content? Are they are they something else? Should we be calling them this? Is that one of the key things I think um, about the future of content really has to do with uh, content not being held inside, uh, and that the we need to open up more and uh, allow content to be dialogic, uh, and so kind of looking forward to opening up um, the possibility of shared authority. And in terms of creating content, narration, story, whatever we're going to call it. So that's it. All right. I apologize ahead of time for the wonky back and forth I'm going to have going to the web. I still can't believe that it's not easier to go from PowerPoint to or Keynote to the web. But um, so my perspective, I spoke at museums on the web earlier this year, and I'm speaking now here. And I find it interesting to be coming from a place which is about teaching students to think about museums um, and to be trying to work with those same students in developing uh, exhibitions. And so I wanted to talk about, I did some alliterative stuff, that's always fun in the academic world, um, so about pedagogy process and product as a UX continuum. I think we could probably spend my entire speech problematizing all the words in that um, title, but we're going to go with it for now. Um, but the first one I wanted to talk about um, was how do we define user experience? So Robert came to me and we've been talking about user experience and then I thought it's like, ugh, it's one of those like we abbreviated to UX and it's kind of an awful term. So I decided like many of us have here to kind of do some back digging. <clears throat> when you do back digging and you're talking about design and interactivity, then you almost always end up with Donald Norman. Uh, so I don't know who's familiar with him, but he's a phenomenal design theorist, a phenomenal designer, worked with Apple back in the day um, and consults. And so he um, says, and he is no, he's actually found to be the person who first used the term user experience, uh, actually in changing a job title. Um, he didn't like the term interface design. So in 1998, he wrote that, I invented the term because I thought human interface and usability were too narrow. I wanted to cover all aspects of the person's experience with the system, including industrial design graphics, the interface, the physical interaction, and the manual. So I bolded system here because that kind of stood out to me. Um, uh, my background is kind of weird and varied that has got me to museums. I was actually a scenic designer, um, and then I got my PhD in theater history, and while doing that, I did a lot of work with interactive technology and pedagogy. That landed me a job running a media lab in an institute that focuses on material culture, and now I work with students and faculty curators um, and contractors to develop exhibitions out of curricular work. So those are all systems to me. Um, and I see the development of systems as a really important way of thinking about these different practices and making sure you're designing the way you're interacting with the system. So I went on, and I found another definition from the more kind of less uh, fluid and more kind of uh, stale International Organization for Standardization uh, in one of their documents on ergonomics of human sister in system interaction, part 210, human Centered design for interactive systems. Uh, this is a very bland document, um, <laughs> but it has a really good place to start with their definition of hum user experience. So for them, human centered design, um, and so this is my idea of designing systems, is an approach to interactive systems development that aims to make systems usable and useful by focusing on the users, their needs and requirements, and applying human factors, ergonomics, and usability knowledge and techniques. So 
they're using systems in kind of a more focused way. This standard is more for like what things should look like on a on a screen when you make a website, and your your menu bar should be over here, and your your cl X close should be over here. But once again, it, re it reiterated this idea of systems and the way we interact with things. Um, if you go further on into their um, definition, you get their actual definition of user experience, which is persons' perceptions and responses resulting from the use and or anticipated use of a product, system, or service. So this is kind of an affective response, right? It's the way we feel about the system that we're using and the way the feedback reaction we have with that system, in a web page in this case, but it could be an exhibition space, it could be a book, the way that we feel and the way we respond and the way we feel comfortable in that system. So we have a system at the Bar Graduate Center called the Focus Gallery. And I'll read this and I'll describe it more. So the Focus Gallery, um, this is official BGC documentation. Uh, the Focus Gallery presents small-scale exhibitions that are part of an academically innovative project that also includes graduate seminars, public programming, and publications both in print and online. Envisaged, envisaged, envisaged as a laboratory, Focus Gallery projects promote experimentation and display interpretation and the use of digital media and reflect the BGC's commitment to exhibitions as integral to scholarly activity. So the impetus for the focus gallery was to try to find a way to embed the exhibition practice we have in our galleries. We have three stories of gallery space in the building that are kind of our main uh, shows. And then on the fourth floor, a smaller space, about 20 by 20, which is the focus gallery space. And that show, those shows are connected to two to three seminars over the course of two to three years in which a professor works with students to expand out a topic, to consider its stories, its narratives, its research background, and find a set of objects with that they wish to display to show that story. I was hired in uh, 2009 to run the Digital Media Lab, and it became very apparent early on that the challenges of the size of that room and the scholarly ambitions meant that we could do things with interpretive digital interfaces that would allow us to push the boundaries of scholarly argument even farther than we had originally thought. Um, I had this idea of thinking about the experience of a gallery in that the curator's job is to lay out, and the exhibition designer, the whole team, is to lay out the objects in the space as such to build a web between them with the, kind of these invisible threads. And as you walk through the space, you're kind of hopefully gathering these threads. There are two objects, and there's not a whole ton of text telling you why they're connected, but they're in that space together for a reason. And the layout, the kind of unspoken narrative in that space, is something that we hope you glean from that experience. And it really is kind of walking through these connective threads that are invisibly in the room. My thought was that adding interactives meant we could add an entire massive nexus of new threads to that space. We could add additional materials. <clears throat> we could have alternative interpretations and perceptions of the interior materials within the room. So that kind of walking through the web experience could be heightened. We can enhance the argument we can make. We can make that argument more scholarly um, and less limited to the wall panels that Jennifer was talking about before. Oops, I went too far. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of been our mission, to not make interactives that simply recreate an object um, or just pose a few um, small connections, but really that enhance and maybe another parallel or supplementary argument, something that adds a much higher level of context in the materials that are in the room. So the show that we currently have up is called Visualizing 19th Century New York, and it's, kind of, it's probably the show that we has pushed this idea the furthest. We've done about four or five heavy interactives, and this one has three in, its, in its, uh, the exhibition space on its own. Um, that is partially because the person doing the work is not only a 19th century New York scholar, but the head of new media research at our institution. And him and I for a long time planned how we would really push the digital limitations of this project and to be able to take advantage of the additional qualities of um, touch screens. So as you can see, this is the space. This is kind of one view of it, um, another view. It's not huge. Um, and then there's a landing. Uh, and on that landing is our first interactive. Um, so this interactive tells a story about a particular intersection. So th to back up a step, actually, this map here is one of the most phenomenal objects we've had in the BGC since I've been there. It's an eight-foot map that has a companioning other eight-foot map, which goes beyond 52nd Street. Um, it's for the mid-19th century of New York. It's completely hand-drawn um, and has ridiculously fine detail. You can go in there and see the pencil hash marks. Um, and it ended up being a foundational object for the digital interactivity. Um, this is a spatial story. The idea of visualizing 19th century New York was to tell a story of the entrepreneurs that made prints that kind of divine, define the way we think of New York um, in this 19th century time period. And they were lithographers. They were um, daguerreotype makers. They were um, 
Uh, they were making parlor furniture. Um, they were all along Broadway. And so we wanted to spatialize how these people were close to each other, how the kind of nexus of visualizing in industry was in the space. And so this map and the idea of plotting these stories on a map was an important part. <laughs> So one of those stories was this intersection of Broadway and Ann. So Broadway and Ann is very downtown. It's kind of where JNR Music World is right now. That's my reference point. Um, and uh, what the students in the class did is they found a lot of prints from that time period that both focused on three landmarks um, and then th cover the time period of about 50 years of looking through prints at landmarks and being able to look at change over time and how prints can define that t t change. So you land on a page such as this, and you can either go to see the intersection over time, or you can go to see the, the intersection as defined by the landmarks. Um, and then you can go into each print, and in this case, um, we were highlighting areas, so these yellow, yellow boxes, you could click on them, and they would tell a smaller story. We have um, an arrow down here um, that is uh, symbolizing how you would be, where you would be looking at if you were looking at this print um, in the space to kind of ground the different looks that everything was doing. Um, and we have contextual quotes and descriptive information about what is going on in that print relative to the story of the intersection of Broadway and Ann. We had a secondary uh, um, interactive called Behind the Scenes. Um, and Behind the Scenes wanted to tell the story of those people who labored to make the prints and visualizations that the show was talking about and which were actually in the space. So one of these chances to sh show a secondary scholarly argument that would be really hard to show with just the objects on their own. But fortunately, <clears throat> during this time period, these industries were also championing their, themselves with prints about what was going on. So this is a print about printmaking. Um, <clears throat> and so we made some hot spots, and each one tells a different story. I don't remember exactly what is going on in this. We can read it. but uh, So this is Harper and Brothers, which do um, amazing woodcut prints. Um, and so there's a story of a lot of women laborers in the background, the kind of conditions, the kind of pictures of the conditions in these drawings, but the actual conditions, you know, all sorts of toxic chemicals, whether they knew they were toxic or not at the time. And being able to dig into that story in a way that would be hard just with a, a lithograph or with a print. And so actually you can see that this, uh, this little book actually has this image, the bigger image. So it, the little image is this big about the entire work ons that were going in Harper's. And so it's hard to tell a lot based on this tiny little book, but to be able to bring out the digital and make the scholarly move really elaborates experience in such a small space. So that was all framed within a larger project of making a digital publication. Um, and to think of all this content as accessible online and in a longer frame, and to step away from the, some of the limitations we were finding in the interface of the book to make a more friendly interface to the content we had. So this map is clearly spatialized, uh, spatializing everything, and now I can go to the website, and see how quick and nimble I can be. Oh, there we go. So this is the site, and you can see that if we go in here, we now have the map, and it drops in pins, um, and if you roll over the pins, you get a preview to the NSA, and if you click on the pin, you get essays, and so there are 20 essays written by students, and this will be an important factor when I move on to the next um, topic. Um, and these are long essays that incorporate the uh, items that may or may not be in the show. You can get individual looks of the item in full on the screen, and have all the fabulous scholarly armature, which we um, find is very important for our student work. Um, so this is online and also accessible in the space, and in addition, you can also see out of con the context of the exhibition gallery, the exhibitions, I, the interactives I was talking about. So here is Broadway and Anne, and now I can show you actually how the interactivity works, going into the intersection, being able to click in. So this expanded our idea, idea of there we go, um, of really working towards high-level digital interactives that expand the story in the classroom. So what does that mean, and what does that mean for user experience? So what it really is is about thinking about rhetorical and experiential frameworks for user experience, both in the classroom and in the gallery. And I want to think about the continuity of this experience, of user experience, starting from the very beginning of gathering information, and in this case through a course, 
um, and the user experience of the students in that course, flowing through the transition of that material into work that the staff is processing for design, and, then, and even their user experience with different platforms, and then taking that material and moving it even further into the space as a fully user experience that focuses on all the great things that Corey and Jennifer have mentioned already. So we're starting a new pro project um, that I'm curating as well as doing digital initiatives for. Um, and there are some different rhetorical and experiential frameworks. So we have traditional readings and lectures um, that students work through. Uh, we have discussion. But then we move on to more complex things that expand the way that we allow students to experience and work with materials in, the, in these types of projects. So the, in this case, it's the course site. We have elaborated wikis that allow us to do pretty complex work. There we go. Um, and Rather than just being simple course sites with blogging, we have, along with the traditional syllabus, where you can go into each class meeting and see reading materials, image galleries, students can comment on their material and focus all that work, you know, which is ahead of many curves, but not particularly um, specific to these types of projects. But beyond that, we can build a checklist for the show inside this wiki and have the students reference materials. Um, these particular wikis allow us also to create object records where we can save metadata. We can connect to links for advertising images, which are an important part of this exhibition. Um, we can create a database that students can add more materials to so that they're building out the content in this, the course of study for the materials. Um, and then as they move on, their assignments start expanding into playing an important role in all of this. There you go. And that is in course deliverables. So rather than the final project being a research paper, what we work towards in all of these projects is the students creating things that end up becoming very important to the development of the project. So in my course, the students aren't handing in a research paper. They're handing in um, 250 to 400 word descriptions, histories for five of the exhibition objects. There's about 35 objects in this show. So their, their writing is really writing that will go into a web app and also then be condensed into wall label. Um, they're also prototyping designs for the interactive web app that will complement this entire project. And then they write scripts for three of the five main, five main exhibition objects, and I'll talk about that, which will be interactable with user, by the users. And they worked collaboratively on a layout of a, a wall of objects that will be interactable with and play with that then was given on to the exhibition designer as a, a starting point for ideas. So here the user experience for students is the experience of creating the um, exhibition and understanding what the space is going to be like based on their understanding of the material um, and based on their understanding of how they would like to visit the exhibition. So we go back to this set of um, things that happen in the classroom and then we can start thinking about what happens in the gallery. So we have those materials and we the, the one of the big important steps talking about the, the timeline wall is how you have user experience in exhibition space. Right, so spatial design and wall text, the combination of those things is one kind of user experience. Um, I don't think we talk about that but uh, as much when we talk about digital things, but the digital are only a small component of a larger physical experience. It goes back to the thread kind of um, concept I was talking before. Is like, how are you traveling through the space? How does the position of your digital interpretive material relate to the objects? And how does a competent designer tie all of those things together? So here we see in this project, we've got the, uh, the timeline, let me get my mouse over there. Where are you? I don't get a mouse, that's right. Um, we have a timeline of objects kind of going from the wall on the bottom and wrapping around, and in the middle four, the four core objects from history, and then an additional on the top wall uh, connect. Uh, we can see a different angle here um, that shows the way that people will be able to move around and the way that different things are situated. So spatial design is a very important part of user experience, and it's important for us to talk to our students that the physicality of the space and the digitality of the materials we work with should not be separated and taken apart. Um, so that moves us into how we can create didactic interactive experiences. Um, I way too often go to shows where there's a digital interactive, it just kind of feels off to the side and it's not connected. And part of my idea with this show, which is about personal computers, which is about the experience of personal computers, is how can we actually get people to interact with the objects in the show. Um, so fortunately, I picked objects, so the Commodore 64, the Macintosh Plus, the Palm Pilot Professional, the iPad, and the Microsoft Connect, 
which you can buy on eBay for under $200 each. Um, and so I've collected a populous set of objects for which we're creating interactive scripts, which we will then design custom applications for that will run on the original hardware. Um, really breaking down the idea of experience being static and passive and separate from the objects, and really pushing the idea of a museum as a more interactive um, place where the things that have a, a high important uh, role of history can also be things that we can still interact with and remember our experiences with them or with similar objects. So that moves us on to thinking about the digital as a remote experience connected to the physical world. So we are developing a responsive web application um, along with the students that will both enhance the experience in the space but be a way to chronicle the history of these devices outside the space. So we can see some wireframes here. Uh, we have a grid of objects with a browser view, um, you know, an object page. Anyone who does digital stuff knows the wireframes. Um, but really thinking about this as tying in aesthetically, experientially, and narratively to what goes on in the space. They are one user experience, all of these things together. Um, and rather than thinking that we have X, Y, and Z broken apart, that there's a holistic sense of starting all the way with the gathering of the content and all the different interfaces that students, the curators, and the users will use as a single continuum of understanding the way this material flows. So that brings me to the final instance of all this, is that the catalog is not left out of this and that the, the book is an additional interesting interface and user experience. Um, and that it's important to think of it as a designed, created object. Um, I believe my art director is still in the room and who's working on the book currently. Uh, so, And we've been working on our catalog. And rather than the book just being a standard design with the content through it, the whole project has been thinking about this catalog being the user's guide to the exhibition and to kind of parallel the idea of a user's guide for the content. So we're drawing design ideas or drawing experiential ideas from the history um, and kind of implementing them. So what you have is this will be wire bound, like a, a kind of a manual that you would have gotten in the 80s. Um, it has tabs so you can go to each section to find what you want, what you might have had if it was like how to use the hardware, like the software, you know, basic programming. Um, and make, and also we have these line drawings which are going to define the stories within the catalog um, that harken back to these kind of uh, visuals that you find in a lot of these user catalogs. So the idea of creating a comprehensive, broad experience that all of the parts are isolated and um, in a way that you can experience them on their own, but in the best sense, when they're tied together, they create a comprehensive experience of the curator's vision, the student's work, um, and the staff of the project's work combined in the, the space. So what are some of the ideas behind all of this? Well, one, that user experiences are designed experiences. Um, I think one of the interesting things that digital has done is it started to defamiliarize things like the book or the wall label, things that we take for granted that are designed experiences that are of a certain size and you have a font, you have margins and where they go next to the object. All of those are things that have been designed in the past and if we think of everything as these user experiences, we can redesign them, we can recapture the originality of experience and find ways to allow the users to enter their range of interest to it. Secondly, that a range of collaborative voices allows for better understanding of the user, which is kind of an awful term, really. Like the fact that it's entering our, um, our world more from IX design is not a good thing. It kind of makes everyone seem like a single automaton that only experiences galleries in a single way. So, but a range of collaborative voices allows for better understanding of the user as heterogeneous and results in more thoroughly considered design. It's been great. We had the, the web app um, design team come into my class and I had the students do the prototypes. And they, the students pr presented six totally different ways of looking at the web app. And the designers were, this is great, because what almost always happens in design is you have a first impulse, and you get locked into that impulse, and then you kind of move forward from that. And it's hard to break free from it. But having starting with seven completely different ideas to pick from gave them a heterogeneity of experience to start working from. Um, and so that collaborative work, along with keeping our art director, our exhibition designer involved in the whole process and everyone being involved, makes for a really um, thorough and thoughtful uh, situation. Next, integrating consistent design practice across a range of experiences enhances the continuity shared by those experiences. So if you think of the classroom as a designed experience, um, if you recognize workflow as a designed experience, which Robert does really well, um, and if you then think of the experience of the gallery as a designed experience, and you try to find similarities across those, then the flow of material, the flow of innovation, the flow of ideas can more easily go from one to the other because it's been thought through and it's been structured. 
And finally, content producers, that bad word, um, create better experiences if process is considered vital to a practice of making. Um, it's really important to think that the product is not God, but that the process should be given as much due consideration and thought through. That's what I love about pedagogy is it's ultimately process oriented. You have to get students from a total lack of understanding to a proficiency of understanding in 12 weeks. And you have to understand that that research paper isn't the proof product, but rather working through them with an understanding of um, you know, failure and success and uh, elaborating knowledge is procedural. And the same thing goes with coming from the original idea of the curator all the way through to the final display of the exhibition and its kind of expansion through your experience. One thing we're doing with the web app um, for the interface uh, project is that people will be able to leave their memories on the responsive web app, tell their stories about the experience. Because in this case, we're exhibiting experience, not the objects. And their experiences coming to the content are just as important as the, the few ones that we've picked and chose for the show. So if you consider process a pra part of the practice of making, it really enhances the constant reiteration and rethought through of the material you're working with. And that is all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is this it? Um, so we're just about at uh, 1245, and I'm sure people um, especially those who went to karaoke finally need to eat something. Um, but if uh, we have any questions uh, now, um, and I think we'll be here for a few minutes, are there, are there any questions for our three varied speakers? Well, I'm definitely going to, um, in the future, focus less on... There's a question back there. Oh, wait, we have a question? Yes. Please go ahead. Wow. That's a lot juicier title. Is that when your staff sleep with each other? Or? Yes. <laughs> selectively, that was selectively, <laughs> selectively yeah. directed. Not just wide open. We can commiserate later, John. Yeah, I, mean, I was just thinking about the, um, uh, the, 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 the museum. We've come to describe our mission as sharing Chicago stories. Mm -hmm. So uh, that implies this sort of two way street, right? It's not just us creating stuff and yes. figuring out how to deliver it to you. It's, uh, the idea that we're, we're, we've got to transform the museum to be that thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a good mission, right? You're, you're not that yet. You've got to get to some place. You've got to go and get to it. But I think ultimately, in the, uh, you know, I am I'm essentially the first responsible for content development okay. in the museum. But there's also a vice president in charge of interpretation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, is, what does that mean? And I find often <coughs> the difference in our dialogues at the museum are between the subjective and the objective. Yes. And I think a falsity of the objective is really a problem in museums, that there is an objective perspective on anything. Yes. Right? There is perspective and there's uh, subjectivity. Mm -hmm. That's what a rule is, not objectivity. Neither none of us can be objective. And I think the um, if you start to see knowledge as a process rather than as mm -hmm. an end result, you get a lot closer to the opportunity to create something that really is engaging with people and respects them mm -hmm. their ideas and gives them a way to participate rather than a way to just be recipients. I, I totally agree. I think one of the, and I, I'm sure that you run into this, we all run into this, that I think part of the thing is that getting, there's, there's a process that you have to go through to get to the process and that it requires, I mean that the shift that in mindset at, institutionally that most of us in the institutions where we are would need to go through to get to a place where most of the people who are working on content in some way <coughs> would accept the subjectivity is that's a big jump. Yeah. And so I think, I mean, I think we're, we're sort of, I feel like we're kind of, you know, if this conversation has been going on for a little while, but that we're still sort of, it's kind of early days still. And I'm, I think there's a lot more conversations like this that are happening than were a few years ago. So I feel like, you know, we're, we're on that path, but we're still definitely on the path. You know what I mean? Like, we have not arrived at the destination. And, and I'm not sure that there is a destination to arrive at. I mean, I would assume it's probably going to be an ongoing evolution for, you know, for all of us. But I, there are, I mean, I sort of, I think about having those conversations with, um, you know, lots of people in the institution. Just, you know, and how would that go? If we we're like, well, you know, this is all really subjective. And, you know, there would be a lot of like, what do you mean? And I'm like, no, I did the research, you know, and, and so that, I mean, they're, but they're conversations that I think are beginning to happen, which I think is good. You know, I think that relates to, it's the process, there's no end point, right? That's the whole point, right? And the part of the problem is that there is orthodoxy or practice that is assumed um, ways you're supposed to do things. And that's in a, 
that ends up becoming an object objective or rigidifying thing, and those things end up becoming reinforced culturally yes. in an institution. Yes. Um, and then you, you, that's I mean, that's why it's so hard. Is like it's a massive sea change to change that cultural culture institution. Change. Um, and we have just a problem between our larger exhibitions and our smaller ones, right? Like, it's easier to be kind of like process oriented, and, like in the small gallery that doesn't like care about audience and attendance. But in the bigger one, it's been harder for that process to kind of mm -hmm. come out, and there's more of a set of tasks and goals. Yeah. I mean, I think um, if you look at all the terms that were discussed and all the words that came out, all of the really interesting, good ones that uh, went places were all about transmission and experience and. Uh, interaction between uh, people and ideas over history and all of the terms that just kind of sit, sit there are things like job titles because they just represent sort of one person sort of in a static place in time um, or just words that um, just convey sort of a singularity and I think all of the good things that are coming out of the conference like this are about ideas being transmitted. I mean, I think everyone here understands workflow as a process that you evolve over time. You go back to the institution and you say workflow and a lot of people go, ugh, because to them it is a document that sits there and gets Checklist. codified and then ignored over time as things organically drift away from it. Which well, they'll always do. Which they always do. Yeah. Yeah. There is no Ithaca, there's just sailing. Because lichen just doesn't sit there. Yeah. Um, anyway, but I want to thank everyone uh, for coming by and um, thank you. speakers will be here and want questions. Thank you.